I'm here to talk about a certain period of time um, that a lot of people don't know about. I actually put this presentation together uh, about 2011 uh, originally and uh, like I told Ryan, uh, I put together this presentation but didn't have an audience for it. And so now you guys are kind of a captive audience for this and uh, I, I hope you uh, uh, enjoy and appreciate it. So. so there's a group of people, it's black and white, there's a group of people uh, standing outside of what looks like a bus um, uh, that's made of concrete and the saying across the top is in German, the English translation is, where are you taking us? Uh, there's one person in the group at least that is in a wheelchair, uh, looks like maybe two people in, in wheelchairs. So we'll get to this later. I'm going to read these next slides, they're mostly just information. So, um, did you know that on March 20th, 1924, Virginia's General Assembly adopted SB 281, the Racial Integrity Act, more commonly known as the Sterilization Act. The law required people considered, quote, feeble-minded, insane, idiotic, imbecile, or epileptic, unquote, to undergo surgery so they could not reproduce. Between 1914 and 1979, at least 66,000 North Americans underwent surgery against their will under mandatory sterilization laws in 30 states and two Canadian provinces. Those provinces were British Columbia and Alberta. Including at least 685 Washingtonians under our state's mandatory sterilization laws. There were a couple of different laws. 276 of them were labeled feeble-minded or mentally deficient. Those are both in quotes, not my words. So. In 1927, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Virginia's Sterilization Act. It has never been overturned. Six years later, Adolf Hitler modeled his law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases after Virginia's Sterilization Act leading to the forced sterilization of more than 2, 000, uh, 2 million Europeans over the next 12 years. What I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a mental field trip to a quiet little town, little village about the size of Chini, uh, actually with about 12,000 inhabitants. It's nestled in a sleepy little valley surrounded by rolling fields of wheat, oats, barley, potatoes, pastures for cattle to graze. And just like our own medical lake just up the road, it has its own mental institution. This is the town of Hadamar in the western part of Germany. It's about the same distance from the French border as the Tri-Cities are from Spokane. So how many of you have ever heard of Hadamar? I got one, one hand, two, Maybe three? Okay. I believe everyone in the world, particularly people who care about people that have disabilities, should know about what happened at Hadamar. I'll explain. So up on the hill on the northwest of town in Hadamar, uh, right above the lawn that's spelled L-A-H-N -A -A River, is this picturesque monastery that was built by Franciscan monks in the mid-1600s. It's a very pretty little town. And behind that monastery, I don't know if you can see, we've got, um, here's the steeple. Here's the, the monastery back here. Um, behind that is uh, what's called the Hadamar Clinic now. And this is actually kind of an L shape. This is two stories and then this is a three story building. Once upon a time, this was actually shaped more like a W. This was one wing, and then we had the central tower, and then another wing on the, on the opposite side. So I kind of have it in brackets there. So I want you to pay attention to that three-story section and the, sec and the two-story wing that's closest to us there. Uh, the wing on the far end was dismantled years ago. 
So the building was constructed in 1883, about 10 years before our Eastern State Hospital. And in this photo from the 1940s, you can see that the whole building is intact there. So like I say, it's like a W, uh, including the wing on the other side of that three-story tower. And this is a picture of some buses and people being unloaded uh, from the buses. Uh, the windows are covered with, uh, in some cases they were covered with paint, in some cases they were with curtains from the inside. Early on the morning of January 13th, 1941, gray colored buses from the Volunteer Ambulance Service, some with the windows painted over and some with curtains on the inside, rumbled through town and up the hill to what was then known as Hadamar Clinic. This picture was taken uh, from actually from behind the facility, looking toward the village is on the opposite side. Actually, here's the steeple of the monastery back here. So this is up above looking uh, across. Each workday for the next eight months, up to three gray buses would come around to the back, back here, and would pull all the way into a bus garage where the passengers were unloaded and then escorted under a narrow fenced-in walkway, uh, also known as a sluice, into the waiting room on the first floor of this building. So that was through this door right here. These people uh, came in, were, uh, had been living in local orphanages, children's homes, hospitals, nursing homes, and other facilities. Many of them had lived with their own families before doctors referred them to the government. So people would come in from that, through the garage, and now I have some arrows on here that take us through the next sections. They were told that this was a brief stop before they went on to the next facility. And in the waiting room, they come in the door. They were told this was a, oh, okay. Then these pleasant looking nurses, uh, actually there's 12 here, there were 15 in all, and two of them were male nurses, helped them to prepare for a quick physical and a dental examination. They were instructed or insisted in removing their clothing. They were told they would be coming back for their clothes later on. My guess is you have a pretty good idea of what's going on here. It's unlikely that any of these people knew what was happening, even if they had no disabilities. It was all under, under wraps, and they were all deceived, betrayed every step of the way. After a quick examination in a room down this hall, the doctor would select from a list one of 60 fatal diseases to record on their paperwork as cause of death. Most often they chose tuberculosis, pneumonia, or heart failure. Then a nurse would put a color-coded mark or a piece of tape between the person's shoulder blades to indicate whether after they were put to death, uh, A, their, their brain would be removed for further study, or B, any gold teeth or feelings, fillings would need to be extracted. The paperwork was then sent upstairs to the second floor offices where clerical workers typed death certificates and condolence letters to the families, giving not only the fake reasons, but often bogus dates and places for the person's death. In the meantime, the people were ushered down these stairs to the basement where they were told they would be taking a therapeutic shower. Those who couldn't walk were carried down on stretchers. Next, they would file into a room with tiles on the walls and the floor. Between 60 and 75 people at a time were crammed into the 9 by 16 foot room. So right here we have 9 feet that way and 16 feet that way, actually here. Right now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like ten people. Imagine there being you being in here with fifty or sixty-five other people 
in this space. Um, and being naked and cold and not knowing what was coming up next. Then the heavy doors were sealed shut. The next step took no more than 10 minutes. Deadly gas was pumped into the room. And one worker was responsible for looking into a peephole to make sure there were no signs of life. After the room was aired out, workers removed the bodies one by one and carried them into the mortuary room or the dissecting room, which is that's further in the back as the dissecting room, or directly into one of two cremation ovens. Cremation of one body took between 30 and 40 minutes. If the workers got into too much of a hurry and tried to burn the bodies too quickly, it would produce a lot of stinking black smoke and this would draw complaints from the townspeople below. After the cremation was over, workers would scoop up the ashes in, from the ovens into canisters like these, which were then delivered with the phony letters to the families. It didn't matter to the workers that the ashes were not specific to any particular person uh, or any particular family member. This routine continued daily, Monday through Friday, except for holidays, with an average of 65 people being processed, uh, that's in quotes, each day. On the day the 10,000th person was gassed to death, the director halted the work so he and the staff could celebrate with beer, wine, and cheese down in the crematorium. So, the first people to be killed at Hadamar were children, followed later by adults, particularly seniors from nursing homes. Nearly all had physical or developmental disabilities and or mental illnesses, and nearly all of them were German. Here's some of the propaganda from that time. Uh, so we have, I'm reading off a, a translation uh, from one of these. The, the poster shows what what's presumably is uh, an Aryan uh, perfect man who is strong and he's holding up a bar and uh, weighting down the bar on one end uh, is, or on each end is a man um, and they actually have the men drawn more like apes. They're more like monkeys. Um, and the translation says, you bear this burden. One with an inherited disease costs an average of 50,000 Reich, Reichsmarks. It's hard to find a, a, uh, what the, uh, the dollar equivalency is because they don't have Reichsmarks anymore. <laughs> they, they just have euros. Um, here's another one. It's again, it's a, a, like a, a perfect um, man standing with a, a, a white coat, apparently a, do a doctor or a nurse uh, standing in front of a person uh, with apparent uh, disability on a chair. And the translation says 60,000 Reichsmarks. This is what this person is suffering from hereditary defects cost the, German, cost the community of Germans during his lifetime. You, a fellow citizen, that is your money too. Read The New People, the monthly magazine from the Office for Race Politics of the NSDAP, which that's the Nazi party. These murders were part of an official government program designed to do two things. One, to rid the country of so-called, quote, useless eaters, unquote and two, to cleanse Hitler's Aryan race of, quote, imperfections, unquote. In the eyes of many people, German and otherwise, these were not human beings. They were an expensive ca cancer on the national body, consuming valuable, scarce resources, especially hospitals and institutions that could free up beds for wounded German soldiers. 
As time went on, those that simply could not contribute to the war effort were selected for death. Some accounts mention that even disabled German, German World War I veterans were euthanized to make way for younger soldiers. The gassing at Hadamar ended on August 24, 1941, about eight months after it started, in part because of the efforts of one outspoken man. So there are, in this story, there are two heroes. This is one reason why I put this together, is to show that it just one voice can make a difference. The person who spoke out was Clemens von Galen, the Catholic Bishop, Bishop of Munster, which was that particular region in Germany. The cleric not only complained from the pulpit, but also in a letter he wrote to Hitler about the immorality of the program. Hitler relented. By the, but by this time, between 10,072 and 10,113 men, women, and children had been killed at Hadamar. The ovens were dismantled and shipped east to be installed in the new, more famous extermination camps in Sobibor and Treblinka. Many of the now experienced staff were also transferred to oversee those operations. Incidentally, the mass killing of Jews, the so-called um, final solution to the Jewish problem, it wasn't started until November 1942 more than a year after gassing ended at Hadamar Clinic. This wasn't the end of the mass murder at Hadamar, however. On August 26, 1942, almost a year to the day after the official youth in Asia ended, a second wild or secret phase started up. Most of these victims were bussed in during the night. Some were given massive doses of insulin or drugs, while others were deliberately starved to death. That was the most economical, was to just starve people. This man was found in one wing when the facility uh, was, uh, when it was liberated uh, by the U.S. Army. To avoid the smelly, visible spectacle of cremation, uh, the workers buried those victims in mass graves behind the facility, surrounded by high concrete walls embedded with glass to keep out the curious. Each of these graves that you see here, you see the U.S. soldier in front, uh, each of these graves contain the remains of 10 individuals. At least 4,411 people were documented to have been murdered at Hadamar Clinic over the next two and a half years. So even though it slowed down considerably, uh, it still continued until the U.S. Army 2nd Infantry Division liberated the place on April 5th. 1945. I have a quote here from Rainer Werner, who is with People First Network of Germany. His quote is, in Hadamar many people with disabilities were killed. We must not forget. So this is Hadamar Clinic in the 1940s. It's been painted and this is it in 2007. Today, local school children go on field trips to Hadamar to tour the memorial that's been set up uh, to honor the nearly 15,000 innocent people who are murdered there. The old bus garage has since fallen down. And there's some people, they actually, they have some interpretive signs in front of the, uh, of the barn that they've reconstructed. Uh, a replica has been built there in its place, and inside there have been placed these blocks, these white concrete blocks, or I think they're probably plaster. They have the word hope inscribed in them in several languages to commemorate the 15,000. Visitors now enter the, into the same waiting room which has numerous displays detailing what happened here and telling the stories of some who were murdered in the basement and the adjoining wing. So here's people going down the same stairs. They put in a second railing, and if you noticed. It was just railing on one side before. 
this is the gas chamber. That's the 9 by 16 room. Uh, I figure there's about 12 people in this room, about as many as, as are in that section over there. There's a dissecting room. And then at the end of the hall is a life-size photograph of one of the cremation ovens to show where the original ones were located before they were shipped east. And in different places in the basement, uh, there are impromptu shrines uh, dedicated to the children who were killed just a few feet from here. Uh, if you have a chance, there's a YouTube video. I just watched it two nights ago. Uh, ben Stein uh, did, and I think it was 2014, uh, did a tour of Hadamar. And that, with the cameras going through, you really get a sense for how cramped this place was. And it just feels cold and dark. So Hadamar was the last of six official killing centers across Germany set up specifically to exterminate people with disabilities. People were also killed in Polish and Austrian facilities once the Nazis invaded those countries. So now we're overlooking modern day Berlin. This is an aerial I got from Google Maps. Uh, in the lower right down here, you can hardly see it, but this is Checkpoint Charlie. Actually, so that was the gate between West and East Berlin that was there from 61 until 89. Uh, right along this road going up here was the Berlin Wall. And so you had East Germany over here, West Germany over here. What I want you to look at is up here on, in the uh, left-hand corner, there's the Reichstag building. That is uh, basically it's our equivalent, uh, it's the equivalent of our uh, Congress, our legislature. And so it's the German parliament that meets there. And if you go out, you see that here's some blue dots that come out this way. Uh, so this is a walking path or biking path going from the Reichstag uh, through this park. Uh, this park is called Tiergarten, uh, which translates to zoo, really, because 500 years ago they actually had a zoo there. And it's really, it's the largest and most popular uh, park in Berlin. So you go down here uh, and it ends at this dot, which is Tiergartenstrasse, uh, which means uh, Tiergarten Street, and the address is number four. This is Tiergartenstrasse, the uh, street right here. Um, when I figured it out, the distance from the, um, from the right stog to here is one kilometer, which is basically six blocks. The distance from here to the football field uh, from Senior Hall here. It, you know, so it basically it took like 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to walk. And it's a beautiful park, large trees and so forth to get down here. Uh, there's an odd looking building at this address. The roof looks really kind of, kind of strange. It's not flat as such. So there's a little bit closer view. Um, this is the uh, Berlin Philharmonic, Philharmonic. So here's a parking lot, bus, bus loading area on the northwest entrance to the Ber Berlin Philharmonic and the Musical Instrument Museum, which was built in 1963. You notice in the foreground, there's a bouquet of flowers. At this address, Tiergartenstrasse 4, once stood the building that housed the headquarters for German, Germany's Public Welfare Charitable Foundation for Mental Facilities, basically the equivalent of our Department of Health and Ho Social Services. So it was that close to the headquarters, uh, to the government, uh, head of government there. There is uh, some writing etched into this, and it reads roughly the translation, says, uh, in honor of the forgotten victims, at this point, beginning in 1940, in the Tiergartenstrasse 4, was organized the first national socialist or Nazi mass murder named after this address, 
Operation T4. From 1939 to 1945, nearly 200,000 defenseless people were killed, termed life not worthy of living. Their murder was called euthanasia, mercy killing. They died in gas chambers of Grafenick, Brandenburg, Hartheim, Perna, Bernberg, and Hadamar. They died by hunger and poison planned by execution commandos. The perpetrators were scientists, doctors, nurses, members of the judiciary, police, health, and labor administrations. The victims were poor, desperate, rebellious, or in need of help. They came from psychiatric clinics and children's hospitals, retirement homes and welfare institutions, from military hospitals and internment camps. The number of victims is high. The number of convicted offenders is low. So this was placed here in 1983. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it was placed there by Germans with disabilities, including those from People First Germany. That have been, they were instrumental in making sure the world doesn't forget this dark period in their history. More research has taken place since then because of the fall of the, uh, the Berlin Wall. And uh, new records have come, uh, come out and it shows that the number of T4 victims is closer to more than 300,000. In the background there, you can see the gray bus. It's a monument that was installed permanently at this same site in 2008. The 70-ton concrete monuments, the same size and dimensions as those that transported so many people to their deaths all over Germany and elsewhere. And inside is inscribed that question from one of the victims, where are you taking this? There's another uh, replica of this monument. Uh, it moves around from one site of mass murder to the next. The public does not know in advance when or where that mo mobile monument is going to be. It just shows up. So now I want to talk about another one of the heroes in this story. Uh, this is a story of, um, excuse me, Anna, oh boy, um, Link Linkerine. Uh, she's about three years of age on the picture on the left. And on the right is Anna as a teenager with a friend of hers. A family member reported that a neighbor girl had dropped Anna on her head when she was a baby. She was diagnosed with congenital weakness, probably what we would call intellectual disability. Anna was sterilized without her permission on February 18th, 1935 at age 19. One thing about the Germans is they kept meticulous records. It's amazing. They were very proud of what they were doing. They thought they were doing good things for the population. She was diagnosed with kidney disease and admitted to a nursing home three days before Christmas in 1936. And while at the facility, she became an increasingly difficult patient. She was described in some documents as, they said, silly and laughy. In others, she was referred to as the swine girl. Anna was finally gassed to death when she was 24. Her family received a letter saying she died from abdominal collapse. And it turned out that the date given to her family was six weeks after her actual death. This is Anna's niece, Sigrid Falkenstein. During a genealogy research in 2003, Sigrid found her aunt's name on a list of people who had been murdered during the T4 program. Like so many families in Germany, her family knew very little about the relatives victimized during that period. And in 2007, she launched a citizen's initiative to build a more fitting monument than just the one on the ground or the, uh, or the buses. She established a round table at the foundation called the Topography of Terror, and 30 working groups of artists, designers, and landscape architects submitted proposals for a monument. As a result, the German Bundestag, basically Congress, voted in November 2011 
to authorize a large public memorial and they de dedicated 600,000 euros to the project, basically $700,000. And here's what they came up with. This is a 79-foot light blue pane of glass. Um, it was erected on the opposite side of the permanent gray bus. In 2014 is when this went in. The ref in the reflection, the reflection it creates suggests that we should all reflect on the value of human life. Visitors may come away with the sense that none of us can truly avoid being impacted by this and other mass crimes. And this is a picture of Berlin Mayor Klaus Wolverwelt and Germany's culture, culture minister, Monika Gruters, dedicating the monument on September 2nd, 2014. The event was the culmination of years of planning, designing, building, and collaborating. It's barrier free. It includes several panels of information in text, video, audio, and braille formats on the T4 program and its implications into the 21st century. The exhibit is designed to be in the open air in sharp contrast to the coordinated efforts that took place in secret at this same location more than seven decades ago. It's really beautiful, I think. Visitors and relatives of victims bring uh, bouquets, mementos, and photographs to lay at the monument in remembrance and respect. The dedication of the memorial in September 2014, Mrs. Falkenstein said, quote, may this place touch the hearts of people and move something in their minds, contributing to the shaping of an inclusive society that does not exclude anyone and values individuality and diversity of people I can hardly imagine a form of remembrance, a better form of remembrance of the victims. And she added, every human life is worthy of living.